This is the pre-lab <laughs> lecture video for experiment 7, where we're going to separate the components of an Excedrin tablet using a series of acid and base extractions. So there are three active ingredients in an Excedrin tablet, or the equivalent of an Excedrin tablet. They are aspirin, acetaminophen, and caffeine. Um, the aspirin is also called acetosalicylic acid, and acetaminophen is the major component in Tylenol and other um, non-ibuprofen, non-aleve tablets. Um, caffeine is placed in the tablet because both of these are kind of sedatives in terms of the metabolism, so caffeine is there to kind of pick it up in response to the two um, acetaminophen and, and acetosalicylic acid. So the idea is we're going to separate um, the components and we're going to start with five tablets. So each tablet contains 250 milligrams per tablet of aspirin and acetaminophen and 65 milligrams per tablet of caffeine. So we're going to use the acidic properties of acetosalicylic acid um, and we could use the acidic properties of the acetaminophen to extract them from the organic solvent. The way we're going to do this experiment is we're only going to use the um, carboxylic acids acidity in the extraction, but a phenol that is in acetaminophen is also um, acidic. So what we know is that if you take a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acids can be deprotonated by either sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate because carboxylic acids are relatively strong um, acids, at least as far as organic acids go. And so when you deprotonate a carboxylic acid, you make what's called a carboxylate salt. which is just simply nothing more than a deprotonated carboxylic acid. So carboxylic acids could be deprotonated by either sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate. The key thing here is that if you have a carboxylic acid that is insoluble or only partially soluble in water, after deprotonation you make an ionic substance that then will be soluble in the water. And so when we do an extraction with a base, we're actually converting the carboxylic acid to an ionic substance and extracting it out of the organic layer into the aqueous layer. Now, phenols only react with sodium hydroxide. They don't react with sodium bicarbonate. And we'll use this property later on, but uh, not specifically in this experiment today. So let's say I had a carboxylic acid and caffeine, which I'm going to consider to be a neutral molecule. Caffeine could be protonated by acid, but um, it does not react with base. So if we have a mixture of caffeine and a carboxylic acid in dichloromethane, um, remember that when we add water to this solution, dichloromethane will normally be the lower layer like it was last uh, two weeks ago in the um, in the Cloves experiment. In today's experiment, it's possible because we're using sodium hydroxide that these layers could be flipped. So you're going to have to test every single layer every time you do an extraction to make sure you know what the aqueous layer is and what the organic layer is. <coughs> but if we take the caffeine and carboxylic acid, dissolve it in dichloromethane, when we add the, the base to this, what will happen is this carboxylic acid will become deprotonated, so it would react with the sodium hydroxide and it would form the carboxylate salt, which is ionic and then soluble in the basic solution. The um, caffeine will remain in the organic layer simply because it doesn't react with the sodium hydroxide and it's not terribly water soluble at least under these conditions. It's more soluble in dichloromethane. So in this case what we'll do is we'll have a partitioning then. We'll remove the carboxylic acid into the aqueous layer and keep the caffeine in the dichloromethane layer. Well then what we could do is separate out the dichloromethane layer which would have a little trace of water and some and some caffeine in it 
We would then dry that with sodium sulfate like we did in the cloves experiment and then rotary evaporate off the dichloromethane to give us the caffeine. So because we've separated the caffeine and the carboxylic acid into the, into the aqueous and the organic layers, we could separate the caffeine from the carboxylic acid simply by removing the organic layer, drying, and then rotary evaporating. Now, if we wanted to take the carboxylic acid then, what we would end up doing is taking this carboxylic acid group, it's in the aqueous layer, it's in there as its carboxylate salt, and so what we need to do is we need to convert this back to the carboxylic acid in order to get it to come out of water. There's two ways to do that. We can add HCl to the solution, which will reprotonate the carboxylic acid, or carboxylate salt into the carboxylic acid. Sometimes this carboxylic acid is insoluble in water. It would therefore precipitate out a solution. We could filter and dry to isolate it. But if the carboxylic acid doesn't precipitate, then after we've added the HCl solution, what we'll end up with is not a basic solution anymore because that's been um, neutralized by the excess HCl that we add. So we would have our aqueous solution of HCl. Um, if we add dichloromethane, the carboxylic acid, if it's more soluble in dichloromethane than water, it will then be extracted into the dichloromethane layer. Then we could remove that dichloromethane layer, dry it, and rotary evaporate it to obtain the carboxylic acid. So what we're going to do in today's experiment is after we've separated the caffeine from the carboxylate salt, we're going to reprotonate it to form the carboxylic acid. And in this particular case, what will happen is that carboxylic acid will actually be insoluble in water, and so it'll precipitate, and then we'll filter and we'll dry the sample. So the idea here is that by using, by converting the carboxylic acid into the carboxylate salt, we can separate the carboxylic acid and the neutral molecule, the caffeine, remove the caffeine and isolate it, and then after chemically converting the carboxylate salt back into the carboxylic acid, we can then isolate it, um, either if it's insoluble, by filtering it and drying it, or by extracting it into dichloromethane if it's not. Um, in a experiment later on in the semester, we're going to actually use this extraction technique to remove our carboxylic acid um, after we've reprotonated it. So we'll actually use a second part in um, experiment 11, I believe. Okay, so the idea here is that we're going to separate acetaminophen from caffeine from aspirin. And so in your pre-lab assignment, you're, you're to create a data table of the physical properties of acetaminophen, aspirin, caffeine, and all the solvents that we're going to use in the experiment. You're going to outline the procedure in your notebook, and then you're going to prepare the separation scheme using the procedure and all the information that's in the handout. You're going to prepare the separation scheme to show how you would separate or how you are going to separate the acetosalicylic acid, acetaminophen, caffeine, and the starch cellulose binder from each other in this experiment. And so all that information is in the handout. I'm going to get it started for you here in a moment, but you want to do this on a separate sheet of paper. You may want to make two copies of it because I'm going to collect up one um, to grade. You're going to show all your chemical structures and names throughout and there is a handout back in experiment five on how to construct a separation scheme and you should have already done that in experiment five you're going to hand in the separation scheme at the beginning of the lab and we will grade it so here's how to get you started you're going to have a mixture of acetosalicylic acid you're going to have acetaminophen you're going to have caffeine and then you're going to have binder now, since nobody's grading mine, I'm going to just use these abbreviations, but you should put in here the chemical structures and the names. So the first thing that we're going to do then is we're going to take this 
and we're going to put it in dichloromethane and we're going to heat the solution. And what we're going to get then is we're going to get solid and we're going to get liquid. Some of the solids will dissolve in the dichloromethane and some will not. So if you look at the procedure, the procedure actually says which materials are soluble in the dichloromethane and which ones aren't. Okay, and so that's how you're going to determine which of these two, um, where everything is going to end up. So for instance, if I look at the procedure, it says that the starch cellulose binder of the tablets in the acetaminophen will not dissolve in that dichloromethane. And so that means the solid will be a mixture of acetaminophen and binder. What's going to be in the liquid? Dichloromethane, acetosalicylic acid, and caffeine. And so then we're going to take the acetaminophen and the binder and we're going to do something to that next. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add ethanol to it and we're going to boil it and we're going to end up again with a solid and a liquid. And so from the procedure you'll know which one is soluble, which one is insoluble from the handout and so then that will allow us to separate the acetaminophen from the starch binder. Down here we've got dichloromethane we're going to add a 0.1 molar NaOH solution to that and we're going to end up with an aqueous solution and an organic solution. And so then you're going to have to tell me what's in the aqueous layer, what's in the organic layer. You're writing out the chemical structures of these so the acetyl acetosalicylic acid will react with the sodium hydroxide. So over here you want to make sure that you include the chemical structure of the acetosalicylic acid. Hint, it's in its carboxyl carboxylate salt form. Okay, so you're going to construct your diagram like this. If at some point um, you run out of space on the paper, just tell me where to go on the next paper to find your continuation. Okay, but this is how you're going to start to construct that separation scheme. Make sure, again, you show all your chemical structures, all the solvents, all the procedures, whether you're going to use a solvent, um, what solvent it is, and then show the structures, particularly when chemical species change, like acetosalicylic acid becoming its carboxylate salt. Okay, and so that's what you're going to do as the third part of your pre-lab assignment. So just quickly going over the procedure here, the one thing I'll caution you about is that you have to keep all your solutions and layers until the end of the experiment. And you're going to need to keep, you're going to need to mark the containers where you have all these solutions. And you're going to use a Sharpie for that. So make sure that you know where all the solutions are after you do your extractions and your boilings and everything else. If you walk up to a TA or me or Dr. Simmons and just hold up an Erlenmeyer flask and and ask us a question, the first thing we're going to ask you is, what is it? Where did it come from? And if you can't answer that question, then you're just going to have to go figure that out before you come back again. So you have to keep track of all the solutions. Nothing goes down the drain, nothing goes into the waste container until the end of the experiment. If you make a mistake and collect the wrong layer, or you something happens, we can probably find your solution that you need but not if it's down the drain and not if it's in the waste container. So you have to keep all your solutions until the end of the experiment. Okay, you're going to get five Excedrin tablets. You're going to crush them using a mortar and pestle. And you want to make sure that you wash the mortar and pestle out with acetone because we used the mortar and pestle last week to do this finish experiment. So we don't want green Excedrin tablets. Then you're going to transfer that powder to a 50 milliliter Erlmeyer flask. You're going to add 30 mils of dichloromethane and you're going to heat the solution on a hot tap water bath. That means a hot tap water bath. That doesn't mean that you've placed the water on the heating or on the hot plate. Just use the hottest tap water you can get. 
and you're going to place that um, for about five to ten minutes swirling it so that that way you can get um, the acetaminophen and or not the acetaminophen the acetosalicylic acid and the caffeine to dissolve you're going to go ahead and then suction filter that solution with a Buchner funnel and a filter flask then you're going to and this is a procedure chain you're going to transfer the solution to a clean, dry Erlenmeyer flask, or sorry, separatory funnel, not the, not the uh, Erlenmeyer flask. So you're going to transfer that to the separatory funnel and then cap it, and then we'll come back to that solution later. You're going to take the solid, transfer it to a clean, dry Erlenmeyer flask, add 10 milliliters of absolute ethanol, and heat the solution in a water bath, in a hot water bath. Um, until it's just starting to boil. So in this case, you're going to put that hot water bath on the hot plate, get it so that the water is fairly, fairly warm and probably boiling. And once that solution then starts to boil, you're going to go ahead and um, suction filter the solution. Okay. We one thing we caution is we never put absolute ethanol solutions directly on the hot plate. If you put your 50 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask directly on the hot plate and do not use a hot water bath, you will have a fire. So you want to heat the ethanol solution in the hot water bath. Okay, while you're heating it, you can go ahead and clamp that up. You're going to clean out the filter flask and the Buchner funnel from the first step. Then you're going to suction filter the hot alcohol solution and transfer the liquid to a clean dry 125 Erlenmeyer flask and then heat the solution heat that solution in a boiling in that same boiling hot water bath until you reduce the original volume to one third to one half of what it originally was um, instead of adding boiling stones you're simply going to place a stirring rod in the flask and so that'll act as a place where bubbles can form okay so you're filtering the solution and then you're taking that hot alcohol solution reducing its volume by boiling until you've got one-third to one-half of the volume that you had originally. Then you're going to take that hot ethanol solution and allow it to cool to room temperature and then you can place it in an ice bath and hopefully your acetaminophen which was soluble in the ethanol will crystallize from solution. You may have to scratch the side of the flask to start the crystallization. Do not put the Erlenmeyer flask into the ice bath until you can handle it because you don't want the flask to crack and to start all over again. Okay, then you're going to take that solid acetaminophen that you just collected by you're going to collect it by suction filtration. I think the procedure calls for using a Hirsch funnel with the with a sidearm test tube. We're going to have um, we're going to have a lot of acetaminophen, so just go ahead and use the filter flask and the Buchner funnel after you've cleaned that out. You're going to wash the crystals with very small portions of the ice cold solvent, in this case ethanol. Then you're going to transfer that solid without the filter paper to a teared aluminum weighing dish. Make sure you put your name and compound on the underside of the weighing dish and then you're going to place that in the oven to dry. So this procedure where you take the original insoluble material, place it in ethanol, take the ethanol to boiling, that solution then will contain the acetaminophen of the tablet. So at this point you'll have an aluminum weighing dish full of acetaminophen and you can go ahead and put that in the oven to dry um, and then once it's dried you can take the solid out Reweigh and you'll get your mass, and then you can calculate your theoretical yield or, or your percent yield. Now, the solid that remained from that step was the binder, so you can go ahead and throw that out. Let's go back to the solution you placed in the separatory funnel after the first dichloromethane um, solution was made. So you place the dichloromethane solution, which contains acid acetosalicylic acid or aspirin and caffeine. You're going to you put that in the separatory funnel. You're now going to add 20 mils of 0.1 molar NaOH and 10 mils of DI water to that dichloromethane solution. You're going to stop her and shake the funnel, venting often, 
to extract the acetosalicylic acid into the aqueous layer. The acetosalicylic acid will become deprotonated by the NaOH and become the carboxylate salt, and then that will cause it to dissolve in the NaOH solution. Now, for all your extractions, because the densities of the sodium hydroxide and the dichloromethane solution can sometimes be similar, you're going to need to determine every time you do an extraction which layer is the organic layer and which layer is the aqueous layer. And you do that by the method that I showed on the video for experiment 5. Namely, you mark the tops of the layers with a sharpie. You add 5 to 10 milliliters of water, swirl, and then whichever layer grows is the aqueous layer. So you're going to have to check every time what layer is which because it's possible that the dichloromethane layer may not be the bottom layer. And it's possible that your layers may be flipped while the person standing next to you aren't. So you've got to check every layer in this experiment. Okay, once you've determined the aqueous and the organic layers, you're going to go ahead and separate those, draining the lower layer into one Erlenmeyer flask, and the top layer into a second Erlenmeyer flask. You know which layer is which, so take the organic layer and dry it with sodium sulfate, and then you're going to transfer that to the clean to a, with a treat, clean dry 100 milliliter round bottom flask and rotary evaporate off the solvent. Now, as I showed you earlier, what's going to happen here is that you will have extracted the caffeine into the dichloromethane layer and you will have converted the carboxylic acid into its carboxylate salt. And so it will be in the aqueous sodium hydroxide layer. Okay, So that's what we, after rotary evaporation, you'll be um, having caffeine. You're going to scrape out as much of that solid as you possibly can from the round bottom. You're going to place it in a teared aluminum weighing dish, and then you're going to dry the caffeine in the oven. Okay, again, make sure that you mark the aluminum weighing dish with your name and what compound it is. So what do we have left? What we have left is the sodium hydroxide solution that contains the deprotonated carboxylic acid. So what you're then going to do is add concentrated hydrochloric acid drop by drop to that aqueous solution that you have in an Erlenmeyer flask. When you do this, you're going to be converting the carboxylate salt back to the acetosalicylic acid. Aspirin isn't necessarily that soluble in water, and it's even less soluble in acid. So you may see a colorless or white solid start to precipitate. But how do we know when we've converted all the carboxylate to carboxylic acid? Well, what we're going to do is after you add five drops of HCl and swirl, you're going to have to test the pH of that solution using universal pH paper. The way we do that is you dip a glass stirring rod into the solution, and then pulling out the glass stirring rod, touch that to the, to the piece of pH paper. And then what will happen is you'll transfer a solution from the Erlenmeyer flask to the pH paper. If the pH paper turns red, then that means your solution is very acidic, which means you've converted all of the carboxylate into carboxylic acid. If it's blue or green, you have not. So then what you're going to do is add a few more drops of HCl, swirl, and test again. Okay. Now, you do not dip the pH paper into the solution. If you do that, some of the dye from the pH paper will go into your solution and you'll end up with red acetosalicylic acid or whatever pH it is. So we always use the dip method, dipping the glass stirring rod into the solution and then pulling out a drop to test with the pH paper. We never put the pH paper into the Erlenmeyer flask. Right? So once we've got the solution strongly acidic, meaning that the pH paper is red, you're then going to heat the flask directly on a hot plate. It's aqueous. It's now just aqueous acid. It's not going to catch on fire. So you heat the flask directly on the hot plate until it starts to boil. And what you're doing is you're dissolving all of the new acetosalicylic acid into the HCl solution. 
once you get all of that solid to dissolve, then you're going to pull the flask off the hot plate, let it cool back to room temperature, and usually at that point you'll start to see crystals form. You can go ahead and scratch it with your glass stirring rod if necessary to start the crystallization process, and then if necessary, place it in an ice bath and scratch in order to get as many of the acetosalicylic acid crystals out as possible. Okay, we're going to isolate that solid using suction filtration. You're going to wash the crystals with some ice cold water to remove any of the acid that is remaining because if you leave acid in those crystals when you put them on the aluminum weighing dish, the acid will destroy the aluminum weighing dish. So you have to make sure that you thoroughly wash the crystals with ice cold water to remove all of that HCl from that solution, from the crystals. Then you're going to go ahead and scrape the crystals onto an aluminum weighing dish. Again, no filter paper. And then instead of heating the acetosalicylic acid, we're just going to allow those crystals to air dry. Um, and by next week, and actually the next two weeks when we use them again, they'll be nice and dry so we don't have to put them into the um, oven to dry them. But it's critical that you wash those crystals with ice cold water to make sure that you remove any of the acidic solution that still remains in them. The end of the experiment, you should have three aluminum dishes that contain caffeine, acetaminophen, and acetosalicylic acid. You, all the dichloromethane solution that you used should be in the rotary evaporator because it's, it only went into the caffeine solution, which was then rotary evaporated to give you caffeine. So the remaining solution should all be either acids or bases. You can wash those down the drain with copious amounts of water. Since we're using Excedrin tablets, that can also go down the drain. It's just simply Excedrin tablets. Okay, so then you're going to go ahead and clean up all of your glassware and put it back in your drawer in the appropriate area. During the experiment, you want to make sure that you record all the observations, what dissolved, what didn't, if there were color changes. Make sure you record all of your observations in your notebook. And then make, keep track of what solutions are in what containers. So use a Sharpie to indicate where your solutions are. Because if you bring me or Dr. Simmons or a TA, if you show us something, and we ask you the question, what is it, and you don't know, then you're going to have to go back and figure that out. Okay. The next week, then, what we'll be doing is we'll be separating those three components using what's called column chromatography. And so when you do the column chromatography, um, at the end of that experiment, you should have caffeine, acetaminophen, and um, acetosalicylic acid in three separate containers and then the week after that we're going to basically analyze all of our products by TLC and melting point to determine how pure the components were that we got from the acid base extraction and how pure the components were from the, t from the column chromatography experiment. And so therefore what will happen is that you won't have a report due until after we've finished our analysis week, which is the third week, basically, of these experiments. So we do extraction this coming week, we do column the following week, and then we analyze our products in that third week. So then one week later, we're going to be, you're going to be turning in your lab report. And it's critical that all your observations and all your data in your notebook, because you may be writing this report almost a month after you've done the experiment and you don't want to be trying to remember what you did or what you saw. Okay, So that's the pre-lab pre lecture for experiment 7. Pre-lab assignment, outline procedure in the notebook, create the data table for the three components as well as all the solvents that we're going to use, and then finally come up with the separation scheme that you will be performing by looking at the background materials as well as the procedure um, and set up your separation scheme of how to separate the acetaminophen, acetosalicylic acid, and caffeine and the binder from each other.